longer. And now us. Oops, I need to go back to his old because my link is hiding. There we go. Start. Hey, we're live. We are. Afternoon, everybody. Hello. Howdy. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> we have a nice warm day up in New Hampshire. I don't know about the rest of the world. Oh, hey, that's nice for a change, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We may actually stay above freezing for more than two days at a time. It's hard to know what to do. <laughs> well, we're in Southwest Florida, so everybody gets tired of us saying it's about 80. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we do. Trust me, we really do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, we're used to being hated in the wintertime. Everybody hates people who live in Florida. So <laughs> <laughs> we could pick on Georgia, man. We could pick on North Carolina, man. We could pick on any 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 southern state, but Florida, we just reserve all of the hatred for people who get to go outside in shorts and a t shirt on December twenty first. It's like, you kidding yeah. me? Seriously? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, probably out of, probably the most extreme out of all of us is probably Lisa because she's up in the upper Midwest in the Dakotas, and it gets uh, very, very frigid up there. So. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. So, welcome everybody. Glad you can join us all here. So, this uh, the pre-show banter. So, we're just going to kind of chit chat a little bit. So. If you haven't joined the Threat Hunter community Discord already, Ryan has put a link into chat. We'd love to have you come and join us. You can't post for a few minutes after you've signed up. We've had, we find that helps quite a bit with spammers. But uh, after five minutes, you'll be able to join us. And we're going to be down in the live webcast chat, I believe, channel. Yes, live yep, yep. webcast chat with a big red button next to it. So uh, any discussions you got about that, if you have questions you want to post, feel free to put them there. We'd be happy to uh, answer as many as we can during the webcast. I love saying and that because I'm not giving the webcast. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for once, right? <laughs> That's right. And we have Chris with us. Yay. <laughs> And you're on mute, Chris. But isn't me on mute a feature? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought like Ryan knew enough to do that on purpose to just like leave my mic on mute. And if I take it off, just immediately put it right back on again. It, yeah. It's a default <laughs> setting. It's exactly. Default <laughs> setting. <laughs> it, it's a feature. Yes. <laughs> Well, I'm pretty sure um, anyone who's attending knows what Rita is and knows what Rita is about. Um, if not, I am going to post a link in the Discord channel for Rita so you can kind of look that up and see what we're going to be talking about. So. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I'm hoping to learn a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> Well, Eric G's offering greetings and hallucinations and given the yes. background that Chris Brenton has chosen, <laughs> I think that's highly appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Chris, did you have your morning mushrooms? <laughs> yeah, well, we, you know, we decided that like, you know, this is to like hypnotize everybody into believing that this stuff is easy and anybody can do it. It's that or I've got a, these are actually mouse chasers and I've got a, you know, mouse problem in the house and this chases them out of the house. So... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. could see it going either way absolutely yeah we'll have to see what other excuses people come up with for why i have a little spinny things behind my head <laughs> it sounds like the name of a rap metal band that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah it kind of does uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put in a vote that the uh, two things behind your head are actually very, very high end subwoofers. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do make a little bit of a thud, thud, thud through the house. So, 
<laughs> there you go. You see, I was right. It's a visual version. Yeah, I've actually like <laughs> been in the room on the other side of the wall and was like, what is that noise? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and actually, this weekend, we were talking about how whales can project the low frequencies over thousands of miles. So, yes. So I understand what you're doing there. <laughs> yes, I'm communicating with whales off the coast in the Gulf. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, why not? <laughs> Morning for me, 12 a.m. Yikes. Ooh. Well, hey, yeah, glad you that's, can make it. that's early slash late. Mm -hmm. Oh, submarines too. Yeah, that's true. Oh, we got New Zealand here. Yeah, we always get a good represent from New Zealand. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Because that is about as far away from us as you can get. That's absolutely true. Such a beautiful country. Oh, I'm so looking forward to finding some excuse to go back. So, <laughs> at work on BHIS socks at 4 a.m. Ouch. Oh. Wait. Wait a minute. I thought the whole idea of like having people in different time zones was so that people could like work in their time zone. <laughs> yeah. 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 Without having to get up like dead early or dead late. Yeah. <laughs> It's called oh, bad now I know who it is. Have... <laughs> <laughs> At first, I just thought it was some random person, but now, uh, now he's he's given away a little nugget of information. I know who it is. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's bad planning if you stretch out people all around the world and then you make them all work from midnight to eight a.m. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh. Wow, we're kind of like low energy today, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yes, yeah, are. yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. Yeah, that's the end yeah, of that. It's yeah. kind of funny after you said that, nothing happens, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I just get sucked into Discord reading all that stuff. So. Yep. Which is a great thing. I mean, anyway, it's really cool. Absolutely. <laughs> second Monday. There's a reason yeah. it's second Monday. No wonder. Yeah, yeah that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Just like second breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> second breakfast. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess uh, isn't like HBO doing a new series? on Lord of the Rings or is it somebody else? I know somebody's doing like a new Lord of the Rings series. Oh, I, I thought it was Amazon. Seen. Yeah, Amazon. Oh, it might be Amazon. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, they all kind of run together for me after a while, so. I think HBO is doing like some kind of a prequel to a Game of Thrones or something. We haven't checked it out yet. but So they, they've like tested like four of them or something like that so far and keep shooting them down. Um, some of them have even made to like, made it to like filming and then they have just been like, no, this is not going to work. So, oh, wow. well, given the amount of money Amazon puts into their series, it yeah. really does make sense to make that choice really early. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is, are the guys from, uh, uh, top gear slash what's it called now? Are they still, uh, recording? The are they grand all tour. Grand tour. Are they still yeah. recording? So Amazon came up with metrics to show them that people only really cared about the adventures, not the in-studio stuff, which I thought was a bummer. I thought the in-studio stuff was funny too. But uh, once that came up, it like tanked. Um, like the last season has been, I think, two, maybe three episodes, and it's taken like a year and a half. So... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the, the big one now is Clarkson is doing, uh, a series on his diddly squat farm and that's been a hoot. <laughs> I, I guess I there's fully a, another believe, season of that coming up. Yeah. I fully believe he could make almost any topic funny just by being the bumbling idiot he is, but, uh, just, I miss him with, uh, with just with the whole automotive experience was hilarious. Yeah. Oh, well. 
Well, he, cause he had the passion or he has the passion and he's just got a unique way of kind of describing things. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't think I've ever seen another review of like a Lamborghini where the announcer who's talking about the car while they're driving stops and looks at the camera and says, I think a little poo came out, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, if you, if you think about it, that does greatly describe the experience of driving that car, but <laughs> you know, most won't resort to that. So that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Cars and that's one of his best is his review of the Reliant Robin. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's a classic that's one. That's a three-wheeled awesome. car. Yes, and the entire review over. is just him tipping the car over in every turn, over yeah. and over yep. and over again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were literally crying, laughing on that episode. That was hilarious. <laughs> yep, and he was just nonchalant about it, tipping over all the time. So. But I thought it was funny. They kept working in like guest stars that just happened to be walking down the street and could help him tip it right side up again. So walking their dog. Yeah. Who, who, I can't remember who the, uh, the drummer from somebody was, was walking down. Oh, can you help me turn me back upside again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot remember the person. Uh, it was funny. So uh, used to do a lot of rally stuff. Used to get into going to different rally events and that type of thing. And um, uh, Petter Solberg's older brother started running for Ford for a while. And I can't remember what his first name was, but he kind of became known for like tipping the car over upside down all the time. And <laughs> on uh, one of the events I was at, it was Mexico. Um, I got to kind of hang out with the Ford folks. So that was fun. Uh, but what I thought was an absolute riot was in their, um, in their recce area, so this was like behind where any of the normal people could see it was a sign to, to this guy because it had his name on it and it had a picture of a car with a little check mark. And then it had a picture of a car upside down and then had a circle through a slash with it. And that was like the mechanics way of trying to remind him, please keep the car facing this way. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, Q telling James Bond how to treat the Aston Martin. Oh, please return it in good shape this time, won't you? Yes. Yeah. yeah. See, they weren't even worried about good shape. Just you know, <laughs> keep the keep the shiny side up, please. You know, you can bang it up. That's okay. You can drip through the brakes. We expect that. But you know, just please stop tipping it upside down. That makes it. That makes our jobs really hard. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, when it's upside down, all the juices come out. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I could absolutely uh, see his uh, his team going putting some aluminum frame on the upside with little wheels on the top, so that if he ever flips it over, he can at least keep going down the track. <laughs> yeah, Eric uh, G. Exactly right. Just don't dent the Aston Martin. <laughs> Too much. Now I'm like, I got to find out what this guy's name is. Henning Solberg. That's right. Yep. Henning Solberg. So another funny one with him was uh, Rally Sweden. He went off course. He kept the tires down for one, so that was good. But he hit the snowbank so hard that the snow like blew out the windshield. Oh no, he, that's right. He did tip it upside down. So he tipped the car upside down. It knocked the windshield out. It filled the car up with snow, but they were fans around that were able to tip the car back over and they were able to keep running, which was good. But I just remember the shot of him coming in across the finish line where his co-driver had kicked out the rest of the glass. And the camera shot was kind of in, in the front of the car as it drove by. And all you saw were two snowbanks in the car with two faces just sticking out of the snow <laughs> as he drives over the line. So they oh, didn't man. even bother trying to bail all the snow out. They just kept going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And they're probably like, we don't need this added weight right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, well done. Uh, oh, Hemming. Yeah, and actually, now that I think about it, the event I was at, I seem to remember watching him roll at least once. So, hmm. kind of bad when you're a professional driver and that's what you're known for is rolling the car over. Yeah, right. Huh? Well, I must say, knock on wood, I've never 
rolled in a car. So, and I oh, hope I now have. it doesn't happen since I said I never have. So. I have actually the last time I taught rally, I was um, in a car upside down, hanging from the harness. We were in a stream and water was starting to come in. Oh man, oh, man. I would have totally freaked out. Yeah, I would have lost it. Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually I probably actually, would have been I, hanging I, there, passed out. <laughs> actually, I kind of made him. I kind of like knew the guy was going to do it and let him do it. So, yeah. So yeah, I can um, handle all the car stuff. It's just the running water near my head, and where you know, I'm gonna like. <laughs> well, I knew the stream minutes. wasn't that deep. I wasn't that worried about it. I knew it wasn't that deep. So, no so you deal. were just not helpful to your buddy and let him freak out, right? <laughs> well, so, so actually, so this was special forces coming through for training. Oh. And there was one guy, you know, it's all a bunch of young 20 somethings, a bunch of young bucks. And there was one guy who was like late thirties, early forties, uh, who didn't have the reaction time of the rest of the team. And basically the way this stuff usually worked was we were one of the last training they would get before they would get deployed. And this guy had a really bad habit of um, coming into a turn and lifting off the gas. And the problem with lifting off the gas when you're in a turn is that it lightens the back end of the car, which just makes it rotate even more, which makes it more likely you're going to hit something with the back end and you're going to roll the car over. And I had told him and told him and told him, don't lift, don't lift, don't lift. And he would listen for a little while and then go back to into his stuff. So we were coming down a hill. We were supposed to do a left-hander. And he was already getting into where he was lifting in the turns and I knew he was going to do it. And my thought process was, okay, after he leaves here, if he does this, if he does this here, there's medical people around, there's hospitals nearby, there's, you know, stuff to fix us if we break things. Um, after he leaves here, he's going to be someplace on the other side of the world where not only may, where there might not be hospitals, uh, there might be people shooting at him in which case that could be really bad. So better to let him do it here. And yeah, he did it here. And of course, you know, the funny part of that was the car finally finished rolling over, stopped in the stream, water starting to come in. Uh, he shuts the engine off and I looked over at him. And the first thing I said to him before I even asked him if he was okay, what'd you do wrong? <laughs> and he said, I lifted. Yes, you lifted. Are you going to lift again? No, I'm never going to lift again. So yeah. <laughs> At least you didn't say it was a squirrel. Didn't you see him? Yeah. <laughs> squirrel. Yeah. Squirrel. So security, much, much safer. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Keep far. me away from motorcycles. So, yeah. So that was actually a promise to my mom when I was 20. Uh, after the second time she watched me dump a motorcycle right in front of her. Uh, she made me, she first asked me, are you okay? And then the th second thing she did was make me promise that I would never, ever get on a motorcycle again. And I have lived up to that since then. I've repaired and sold and resold a few, but I've never actually ridden one since then. So, wow. so it's a promise to my mom, Eric. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm living up to that. So <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Well, the first time I dumped a motorcycle was my own fault. I pulled in the driveway like late at night and it was a Harley. So it's pretty heavy, uh, but I forgot to put the kickstand down. Uh, so I just went, you know, to lean it over and like normal <laughs> and I forgot to put it down and it fell all the way over on my left leg and, and I was trapped. <laughs> so How did you not forget I'm yelling, to do that? help somebody help me how do you not forget to put the kickstand down it's like a <laughs> well actually um, after that i never forgot it again <laughs> but how do you forget in the first place yeah pain is a great teacher yeah, yeah. well i it, it was late at night we we're at a at a bar playing yeah beer. i was gonna say and, and exactly how much drinking was involved yeah I just, you know I, i'd rather not admit you know that i was you know riding on public roads after having a couple of drinks but but then again, that was many years ago. So. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was back when, when the police caught you, they just told you to go home and would follow you to make sure you do. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and they react slightly differently to that now, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, no kidding. Oh, wow. man, that's an ugly story from But I Am Dominator. Yeah, that, that sounds like Florida. 
Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, that's not good. Yeah, there's this like way too many hit and runs down here, which I just totally, totally don't get. So Chris and Lisa, what are we doing today? What's this all about besides us just sitting here chit-chatting? Well, so one of the things I did want to kind of talk about a little bit ahead of time is, um, you know, so originally this was supposed to be uh, Lisa and I were going to kind of split this and kind of go at it. And um, I, I think as many folks know, Lisa's originally from the Ukraine uh, and she still has a lot of family over there. So needless to say, what's been going on there has been... Um, I don't know how she focuses on getting anything done at all. Um, but I think one of the biggest challenges has been, uh, at least for me, has kind of been you want to try to do something, right? And what do you do? And there are some uh, good organ. So there are definitely some scammers out there that you have to watch out for, which, you know, I really hope there's a special place in hell for folks that um, take advantage of people's troubles to try and make some additional money off of that. Uh, but there are some good organizations that are trying to do what they can. I think uh, Airbnb is probably a great example because what Airbnb is doing is they're letting people in Ukraine, um, even when their homes have been bombed by the Russians and don't exist, they're still letting them rent those out to people. And you can rent a place in the Ukraine and just you know email the person and tell them, um, I'm not coming to stay. This is just my way to try to inject some uh, money into that area to help people as needed. Um, Airbnb has also been doing what they can within Poland and the other neighboring countries to um, try and help people find places to stay. Um, and, you know, again, waiving fees and that type of thing. And I think that's been really stand up of them is that, you know, they waive their fees for doing it. Um, and they're just trying to do the right thing, which is really cool. Uh, the challenge with that stuff is in order to get to any of those resources, you need to get over to the um, western side of the Ukraine. Um, that's not always an easy thing to do, especially now that they're bombing in the western side and a lot of the major cities are just circled um, and it's just hard to get, get in and out. So one of the things I talked to Lisa about was how do you help directly? You know, because there's organizations that do good work, but they also kind of split it up across the world. Um, and this was someone she came up with that is running the volunteer effort in, at least I think this was the city you were originally from, wasn't it? Uh, it there's actually yeah. a correction. It's, it's Zaporozhye. And oh, I'm from I'm Zaporozhye, so he's running the effort in Zaporozhye. However, the... A lot of the refugees from Mariupol are coming up through Zaporozhye, so. Can you just talk a little bit to like what that effort takes or, or what's going on with that effort? Um, sure, I can try. Um, uh, basically, we are on the, Zaporozhye is on the, is between it's kind of in the east to southeast and um we are in a sense surrounded by occupation from the east and the south um there's multiple fronts in ukraine though and the city is not yet occupied but um the surrounding areas are and people are getting ready for occupation a lot of there's a lot of need a lot of people have relatives in the surrounding villages and can't get help to them um there wasn't a lot of organization um so the cities and this man has done a lot of work for helping organize that there's multiple telegram channels where people can ask for help for medicine offer what they need um what they have um, um there's children weaving camouflage netting um people welding anti-tank barriers and things like that um but a lot of it is just like i need help for my elderly father he's in this village and then they organize um 
a car or a bus to try to go down and they have lost people um, doing that. Um, a, a lot of the help that does come ends up in Western and Northern Ukraine and not that they don't need it, they absolutely do need it, but it's hard to get help to my area. So that is why I'm asking for help for my area. So, you know, this is obviously not, you know, um, not a tax deductible donation. This is trying to directly help people as opposed to trying to filter it through an organization. Um, if you follow the Facebook link, this it, it kind of documents the work that they're doing, uh, which it just through amazing odds. When you when you follow the link, and by the way, the slides are in the uh, next channel down the webcast content channel. Um, it's in it's written in Russian because you know that is common language over there. Uh, but Google will give you a translate button to bring it over to English so you can read through. And just, you know, what these folks are going through is just heartbreaking. And one of the challenges is how do you get money over there? So one of the few ways Lisa's been able to find is you can send money directly to somebody's credit card or debit card, um, which is what we have up on the screen here. So if you go to the Western Union website and say you want to send money to the Ukraine, um, you can go through and you can say, I want to send it to a debit or a credit card. You know, this is the person who's running the volunteer effort. Uh, this will get it directly to where it's needed the most. Um, you know, it, it would be very, you know, it's obviously not required to do this, but if people are up for it, you know, it's like everything else. It's like every little bit helps. And this is the toughest part of that country to get any help into at all. Um, so it'd be really appreciated. And Chris, I, I love you. I'm just going to make a little correction in case there's any Ukrainians on the chat. Um, oh, please do. Please do. It's not the Ukraine anymore. It's just Ukraine. Sorry. And <laughs> we are so, um, it's part of the whole movement for our freedom is we're no longer a territory. So, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, thank you for that. And I, I know it's, it's really hard for you to be online right now, but you know, this, to me, this does really hit within our community because I think we all know somebody that um, has family over there or you have family there yourself um, or are just, you know, outraged by what you're seeing going on TV right now. And, you know, for some of us, it's, frustrating to try and find the best ways to you know give and help out over there if you can um like i said th this one to me is kind of cool because it's it's directly to the eastern side of ukraine where it's needed the most and it's directly to an individual that's running the effort to do this um i think that's just really cool yes this means a lot to me thank you everyone and thank you for listening it, it means a lot to us too um, yeah. uh, i'm afraid it, it's one of these um, world situations it's it's really so hard to put into words um how it makes everyone who's free and peaceful how we feel uh, yeah. and and i have i have that same problem it's hard to put into words but it, it's it's just a horrible thing that uh, i hope will just end very soon it's it's a tragedy. So I'm, I'm sorry for everyone in Ukraine, as well as yourself, Lisa, your family. Uh, and, and like you were saying, Chris, it, it is a bit frustrating uh, that we can't directly help or do anything. So um, thank you for putting this up here. So uh, at oh, least thank we Lisa. have an outlet. Lisa's the source help. of this information. And for folks that are wondering, you know, who is Lisa? because she's camera shy and doesn't go on the webcast a lot. Uh, Lisa is uh, one of our engineering gurus. An awful lot of what Reader is and how it works is because of her. So the tool we're going to talk about today, you know, we're, we're, we're the brains that makes it actually as good at it, what it does is it does. You're looking at the person who does it right here. Yep. And, and she, like will de she will deny that and say it's everybody else but her. But, you know, sorry, I'm going to override that. 
I'd like to just take that one step further and say that if it were not for Lisa, Rita would not be with us. So. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Hundred percent agreed. Thank you for those kind words. <laughs> cool. And with that, I think we're at the top of the hour. We are. We'll pop off. Cool. So Ryan, you got anything you want to run through before we get started? Uh, I've got in the chat some links that uh, you guys can check out for future uh, webcasts. We've got a training coming up as well. And in the chat, there's a link for the Discord if you're not on there yet. I will say that this webcast is being live streamed right now on YouTube. And it is also going to be on YouTube for the recording. So the link that you can grab from, uh, it should be on your your zoom i can put in the zoom chat again um if you want to watch it later that's where you'll go right on youtube and all the chat's going to continue even after this webcast is over right here in the threat hunter community discord so we can ask questions that you didn't think of now later on and the team will get back to you and with that handing it back to chris cool thank you dude <clears throat> So I uh, put a copy of these slides in the ACM-webcast-content channel, which is the channel just below the one we're using for regular chat. So uh, feel free to go grab those. That way you get a copy um, and you can see what we're kind of running through. Um, I think most folks know we're, a <laughs> we're, we're part of a, I don't know how many companies there are there now. These are the four main ones. Uh, John just keeps starting new ones all the time. But uh, we got a bunch of sister companies and, you know, we all kind of work on this stuff together, which is really cool. Um, all the stuff we just kind of talked about, if you want to try and do a, a direct donation to the eastern side of Ukraine, um, here's information for that. We kind of talked this through in the pre-show banter. And if you go through this and you kind of want to keep going with the training, got a couple options for that. You know, if you've never done a whole lot with packet decoding and you want to kind of start with that and kind of move forward, Got a packet decoding class that'll be going off soon. Um, we're doing another free level one threat hunting class at the beginning of April. Um, so if you want to attend that, and if you want to do an advanced class, hey, we've got that. But today we're here to kind of talk about RITA. So what is RITA? Well, you can see what the acronym stands far up there, but actually where the name RITA came from was this was John's mother. Uh, who passed a number of years ago from cancer. So in a lot of ways, this was kind of a memorial to her, was naming this tool after her. Um, but this to me is just a really cool tool because it solves a problem that we have that quite honestly, there's not a lot of tools that do a really good job with it. So the fact that we're able to offer this tool up for free to folks um, is just really cool for me. Rita is designed to identify persistent connectivity. So the concept is you have a host on your network. It's talking to someone out on the internet and it's doing it all the time. You know, maybe it's once every minute, maybe once every hour, maybe it holds the connection open all the time. There's some sort of persistency with the amount of communication it's doing with a host out on the internet. If that is occurring, you should be able to understand that and describe that and understand the business need behind it. it. Just to give you an example, just about every system talking to the network is going to carry on a persistent connection with a network time protocol server. And they're doing it to be able to sync their time, right? So there's the business need for that connection. My system should, needs to stay in time sync. That's the business need. So that's why it's talking to that server. Okay, good. We understand that. We understand that persistency. We know that's okay. Well, what if my system is constantly communicating with a host in Kwanzu, China, and I don't have a field office there or a business partner or anything else? Well, that should make me stop and pause. And that should make me ask myself, so why is the system doing that? If I don't have software running that I'm aware of that should be making that type of a connection, what's going on? Why is that there? So Reader is designed to show you those persistent connections so that you can go through and figure out are all those persistent connections, is there a business need behind it? Because if there's not, this is something you need to be concerned about. <clears throat> so in essence, this is what the problem Reader solves. And 
most tools are bad at that because what they tend to rely on is signature-based detection. So some sort of an attack gets created and folks write signatures to be able to detect it. And you know that's good if you're worried about that attack coming back. The problem is we've moved on from that model. You know, in other words, 20 years ago, yeah, if you could write a signature for a particular, you know, malicious set of code or patterns, or look at a particular server out on the internet that's acting maliciously, that data was valuable for a number of weeks because back then it was about mass propagation. Today it's about targeted attacks and there's money and resources behind all that. So with that in mind, you know, the IP addresses of these command and control servers are changing all the time. The domains they're using are changing all the time. So threat intel lists just aren't as helpful as they used to be. Pattern matching on no malicious patterns aren't as helpful as it used to be because they change. So one of, what, one of the things Rita does differently is it works with behavioral analytics to be able to figure out, is there that persistent connection that we were talking about? You know, is there persistency there that we know we need to be concerned about? <clears throat> It does this working with large data chunks. And this is another unique identifier for Rita. When you look at a lot of the tools that kind of label themselves as threat hunting tools, they're typically taking an hour's worth of context or less. And by context, I mean network traffic. So they may take like a, an hour long PCAP or an hour's worth of Zeek data or something like that. And they go through and they look through that to say, hey, is there anything I need here to worry about? And actually I'm only aware of one or two commercial tools they use an hour. Most are using far less, 20 minutes or less. You know, usually it's 10 minutes or less is what they're looking at. Okay, think about that. If I'm only looking at 20 minutes of data and I'm trying to catch something like sunburst, Sunburst would call out to its command and control server once every 15 minutes, plus or minus a minute and a half, because it would jitter the connection a little bit. So if I'm looking at 20 minutes of context, I'm only going to see one, maybe two signals calling home and that's it. Well, it's not enough to figure out if there's connection persistency, right? That may have just been one person hitting a web page someplace or something like that. Well, what if I move it to an hour? Well, if I've got an hour, now I've got three, maybe four connections taking place. It's a little bit more likely you might be able to identify persistency, but it's not a whole lot of data points to work with, so you probably wouldn't. So what Rita does is Rita likes to work in 24 hour chunks or more. Well, with 24 hours, you're gonna get about a hundred connections with Sunburst taking place. A hundred connections is plenty to sit down with math and figure out, yeah, there's persistency of connection here. Typically working with 24 hours. <clears throat> um, I'm aware of some highly secure sites that actually look at like look at data in week chunks instead. So they'll actually take a week's worth of logs, process those all at the same time. And yet with Reedy, you can go through and do that. It's going to take a while to process the data because it's a whole week. And typically those are higher bandwidth links but it will do that. It will go through and you know, give you some results based on that. Why would you wanna look at a week? If you are worried about like the top, top nation state people coming after you because your data is that valuable, yeah, maybe you need to look at data in a week chunk versus a day chunk. For most of us, 24 hours is fine. But for like the highly secure sites, yeah, you might wanna look at something like a week. And Reader is one of the few tools that gives you that type of capability. <clears throat> So system requirements are actually pretty minimal considering what it does. And it really depends upon uh, whether you're going to have Z collecting data and reader running on the same system at the same time. You know, if you're going to run both tools at the same time, system requirements go up a little bit. If you're going to separate them out into two different systems, requirements go down a little bit. I gave you some ballparks here, but you know, your mileage may vary a little bit type of thing. <clears throat> so Rita doesn't actually collect data itself. Reader relies on Zeek for that. So Zeek will go through, watch what goes by, write out log entries based on what traffic it's seen. And then Reader will go in and parse those logs to see, is there anything interesting in there that you need to go in and pay attention to? So where do you get Reader? Here's a couple of links for it here. Links have been short, shared in the Discord channel. Um, so you get a couple of different options here. And what I wanted to do was rather than just kind of <clears throat> showing you a bunch of slides, let's go through and actually do an install on Rita so you can see what this process is really like. 
So I see a question, any updates on Ubuntu 20 versus Debian and Bill's already in answering those. Awesome. <laughs> so thank you, Bill. So that's cool. So yeah, well, I'm running this on Ubuntu 18, as you can see. Uh, we've had some issues with the support for Mongo, which is what really uses his database backend. <clears throat> we are looking to change that in the future, uh, but for right now it is Mongo. So we'll go through and we'll, um, you know, we're in the process of pushing out some updates that'll include support for 20 in the near future. But for now, I'm running this on Ubuntu 18, so everything we do will be going off on there. So I'm logged in, I'm logged in as myself. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to just make a directory to dump this stuff into. So I'm going to say mkdir reader, and then we'll cd into that reader directory. And okay, we're ready to go. So the first thing I need to do is I need to download the install script that's up on the GitHub page. So those two links I gave you a uh, slide or two earlier, that has that information on it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the wget command to go up to GitHub and grab the, this is the latest version of the install script for installing reader on the system. So I'm just going to go through, hit enter on that. You can see it downloads it. And now if I look, I've got my install script here. Now, one thing I want you to notice when the install script gets downloaded, it's not executable, right? So I need to make this an executable in order to get it to, well, execute. So I'm going to say chmod plus x. I want to add the executable flag and do that to install. So now when I do my ls-al, we can see, oh yeah, hey, there's my x. <clears throat> this is now executable. It's all ready to go. My install process needs root level privileges in order to run. So I'm just going to say sudo and then run that install script. I need the period forward slash to tell Linux I want to run this in the local directory, not something that's just in my path. And now when I go through and I run that, pops prompts me for my password. I have to remember which one I'm using on this particular system. Hey, I got it right. What do you know? And then it'll go up, that install script will just automatically go through and start trying to install, uh, see what the latest and greatest version is of Rita. And then it'll go through and it'll start running the install process for that. So one of the things you're gonna notice is that as this runs, it's going to figure out, uh, it's looking to see is Zeke installed on the system, is Mongo installed on the system? <clears throat> if they're not, it'll install them for me. So I don't have to like download Zeek and deal with the install process for that and the tuning and everything that goes along with it. Uh, we'll do that for you. Okay, so the install process is paused. It's saying, hey, would you like to continue running the Zeek configuration script and generate a new file? In other words, do you wanna use the default one or do you wanna use the one that we created? Uh, answer yes to this. You wanna go through and you wanna say, yep, go ahead and tune it so that it runs a little bit more efficiently. And one of the things Rita needs to know is, okay, what network interface do you wanna listen in on? So what I should have done was looked at my network interfaces before I started that to figure out which one is my external. <clears throat> I purposely didn't because <laughs> I wanted to show you that. We'll pop up and we'll show you what interfaces we find which ones are connected to the actual network. So it won't show you like the loop back and stuff like that. But you also get to see, is it transmitting? Is it receiving traffic? Because that can kind of help you figure out, is this the interface I want or not? So I'm looking at ETH0 and I'm going to say, yes, I definitely want to listen on that interface. And it says, oh, okay, there's also an ETH1 interface here. And when I look at that, I can see, yeah, there's not much traffic going on there. So I'm actually going to say no to the second interface here. Now, what you see may change depending upon what your config looks like. <clears throat> now it's gone through and said, okay, here's the changes I'm going to make to node config, like I'm just going to run PF ring. It's identified the network interface to listen on. Is this okay? And I'm just going to go in and tell it, yes, it's okay to do that. Now it'll go through. <clears throat> it will um, write those changes out. It'll stop and restart processes as needed to make sure all of these configs get done. Um, and then once it's done with Zeek, you can see it's now moving on to Mongo. So now it'll run through the Mongo process. Uh, when we install Mongo, we expect Rita to be talking to it locally. So there's some insecure choices we've made 
based on assuming that Mongo is running on the same system as Rita. If you're going to be doing it differently, there's some things you're going to want to change. And I'll talk about those in a little bit as we go through. So now it's done. So the first thing I want to do now that it's done, log out. Why? If I try to run Zcut, which is one of the tools installed with Zeek, command not found. It doesn't know about Zcut because it needs, we, so we call the Zeek install process, it modifies the local environment. Um, that doesn't take effect until you log out and log back in again. So I'm gonna log all the way out of that system. And then I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna start up a new SSH session. Oh, I actually have a password login for this one. That usually doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> I had to do some screenshots for Bill. I wanted one of them to use password logins instead of uh, public private keys, just so you could see the difference in a particular interface. So yeah, this one's still password. Normally I'd use public private keys. All right, so now I'm gonna say Z cut again. And hey, look, it didn't come back and tell me it couldn't found it. It's just hanging here because Z cut you know, need some parameters that are handed to it. So I know that this is running the way that I want it to. Cool. So now I'm going to CD back into that reader directory again. You can see what files get, you know, the only thing here is the install. The other thing Rita puts in is it puts in a uh, temp lock file for the reader install here. So it'll put that out in the home directory. Notice that's owned by root. It's not owned by me. Um, so that's the other thing that reader will go in and put in there. Now, the next thing we need is we need some data that we can pull into uh, Zeek, or excuse me, there's some data that we can pull into reader to go through and analyze. Well, Zeek is gonna put its logs in op, Zeek log, yeah, this directory here, current, oh, I need sudo. So normally my logs will get located here, right? And then one directory above that in uh, this location here, opseek logs, it will start writing out um, each day. So it isn't there yet because we just created this. But if I waited until tomorrow, I'd end up with a directory that's named, you know, March 15th, 2022. So that'll identify all of the log entries that were collected from today. And then Zeek will go through and create its log entries uh, in one hour chunks. So we'll end up with a lot of different log files. So I could wait until all that gets created, but hey, that's gonna make for a really long webcast to just sit here and have this thing uh, generate log files. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm just gonna go through and I'm gonna pull down a uh, file to go through and analyze. So let's see, where did I find it? Here we go. So I'm gonna throw this into the Discord channel just in case anybody else wants to grab this and play around with it, uh, just so you can see what I'm working with here. But I'm gonna go through and I'm running wget and I'm just going up to EC2, uh, to, not EC2, but to S3, to an S3 bucket to pull down this trace file. So I'm gonna go through and run that. You can see it's about 20 megs, it's pretty small. Here, there's the file right there. And now I'm gonna say G unzip that. And now, hey, look at that, I've got a PCAP file. <clears throat> cool. So now I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna, now that I have a PCAP file, remember, Rita doesn't read things directly, it uses Zeek logs. So the first thing I gotta do is turn this into Zeek logs. So I'm gonna say Zeek, dash capital C, ignore any CRC errors because traffic may have come in the same interface that was being sniffed, dash R, and I'm just gonna call it extra trace two dot cap. And then I'm gonna hit enter. And now Zeke went through and came back very quickly. But now if I do my LS dash AL, I notice I get some new files. I've got a con.log file, a files.log file, an http.log file, and then a packet filter dot log. So clearly what's in this PCAP is probably mostly HTTP traffic because I got a log file for that. So I took my PCAP, converted that into Zeek logs. 
Now I can take these Zeek logs and, imp and import those into Rita. So I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna say Rita import star.log. Now, if I just said star, Reed is smart enough to know, hey, there's nothing in install.sh that I can import. There's nothing in that PCAP file I can import. So it would look at those files, figure out they're not Zeek logs and automatically skip them. By doing star.log, I'm just gonna automatically skip them. So it's not gonna bother taking the time to go through and do that. And then <clears throat> I also need to identify, what do I wanna name this data set within uh, Rita? And I'm just going to name it test, something nice and easy. So now I'm going to hit enter on that. Now you'll notice that Rita seems to kind of hang a little bit initially. What's going on? Rita allows you to append things into the data set. You can actually go in and you can tell Rita, hey, as soon as Zeke writes out its log files, pull that immediately into the data set. And what Rita will do in that mode is it will go through to see um, the, the data that's in these logs. Have I already put that into this database yet? So it goes through and does a check on that first. And once it's done that check and once it's figured out, no, this is in fact new data, as you can see, it goes through and it just starts processing all the files. Once it gets down to done, hey, that means it's done. So now if I do a Rita space list, That'll show me all the databases that are known about within this instance of Rita. And since this is the only data we've, in, we've uh, pulled in so far is this database called test. That's the only one we have to work with. Okay, so I've got my data into Rita. Now what can I do with it? Well, if I just type Rita without any switches, you'll get a list of all of the commands that Rita knows about. So reader will come through and tell you it's looking for evil needles and big haystacks. It gives you the syntax on how to do your commands. What's the current version? And here are all the different commands you can run. The show commands are the ones that you're gonna work with the most. So we wanna figure out, is there any connection persistency within that file? Uh, someone's asking, is the session recorded for later viewing? Oh, yes it is. And it'll be on YouTube and in a bunch of places. So we are definitely going through and recording this so that if you decide you wanna do an install on Rita later, you can just go ahead and follow along with this video. <clears throat> cool. So we wanna go through and figure out, is there any connection persistency? So I wanna start using my show commands for that. So I'm gonna say Rita. Now notice I'm working as a regular user. I don't need sudo for this stuff. So we've written this to run in a regular user context, no problem. And I'm gonna say show beacons. And notice I can use autocomplete. So once I have BE, which is enough to make that command unique, I can hit tab and it just automatically fills in the rest of the command for me. So I'm gonna say, Rita, I want you to show me beacons. And now I have to tell it in what data set do I wanna check for beacons? Well, we already said the name of this data set is test. So I'm gonna go through and use that. And Rita's coming back and saying, hey, I saw one connection in there that I'm pretty certain is persistency of connection. It came from this internal IP address. So this private address going to this public IP address, <clears throat> there were 117 connections that took place between those two systems. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. I feel a little frog in my throat today. So it's gonna go through and uh, yeah, so it'll identify this is how many connections that took place. And then it's gonna show me, um, so basically from here down, as a regular user, probably not that helpful. I mean, if you really wanna get in and start kind of digging into this stuff, okay, fine. But like this value was identifying in those 117 connections that we saw, this was the average number of bytes that we're getting transferred between those two systems. Uh, this is the interval range. So this is identifying that there was a little bit of jitter that was taking place between them. Um, you know, all of these numbers are basically, so here's what this is for. Let's say you find persistency on your network and Rita scored it a dot three or a point three. What's this range? The range is from zero to one. The closer to one it is, the more uh, what Rita is saying is, this is how certain we are that there's persistency of connection taking place between these two systems. 
So in this case here, we're saying we're 70.4% certain this is persistency of connection. So let's say you find a persistent connection between two systems and it only scored a 30%, you know, a 0.3 and you wanted to come back to us to say, hey, I had this persistent connection and read it didn't do a very good job of catching it. The first thing our development team is going to ask you for is this entire line. And what they're going to do is they're going to work with these numbers here to figure out, okay, what did that signal look like? And why did Rita score it so low? What can we do to try to improve that in the future? So like I said, as an end user, what you really care about is I'm going to say from here over. So I care about the score. I care about the source IP address. I care about the destination IP address, how many connections we're seeing over this time frame, and how much data is getting moved between the two. Those are the ones I care about the most. Because uh, why do I care about data? Because the more data getting moved, the more likely this is a C2 connection. More likely data is maybe getting exfiltrated out. So my show beacons command came up with something that I know I needed to pay attention to. So I'm going to make a, yeah, I would make a note about this IP address pair and start diving in a little bit deeper to see, is this something I need to really worry about? Now, um, Rita has a bunch of other commands that probably isn't going to find anything in this data set, like show strobes. Show strobes is, a strobe is just a really fast beacon, right? We, we have a lot of math we use to figure out, is this a, a persistent connection or not? The more connections that take place, the longer it takes for the math to figure it out. Well, what if someone's connecting three times a second and they're doing that 24 hours a day? If your system is calling an IP address out on the internet three times every second, do you really need math to tell you there's persistency there? No, <laughs> right? It's connecting so, obvious, so often, it's very obvious there's persistency there, right? That's where strobes come in. Strobes cut it off at about three times a second. If it's connecting three times a second or more, like four times a second, five times a second, and so on, that's where we say, this is absolutely a beacon. We're not going to bother doing the math. We're just going to shove it under strobes. So you'll still see that there's persistency there. It just won't identify it as a beacon. It's just telling you, hey, this thing's really noisy. You know, you may want to pay attention to it. It might be a false positive. You want to take a look, but uh, it's really noisy. So that's the show beacons. Um, the other thing I can do is I can look to see, is there any long connections, which in this case there isn't. So a long connection is just holding the connection open all the time. And there doesn't seem to be any instances of that here. I can also do Rita, what's another good one? Exploded DNS. Oh, duh. Show exploded DNS in test. So what this will do is this will check my DNS traffic to see if there's any command and control running across that. And you can see here it's saying, well, I didn't see any DNS traffic. Okay, well, if there's no DNS traffic in the capture, there's clearly not going to be any C2 over DNS within that thing, right? Uh, what else could I do? I could do a read. Uh, so I'm not a big blacklist person, but you can um, dump your blacklist into this and we'll tell you if you had any matches against it. So that's we're looking for uh, ones based on host names. I can also do a show blacklist. Uh, what else can I do? Oh, destination IP is another one I can do. So I can look for that. I don't see any of those here. I can also do a Rita show user agents. There sh might be something here because we saw we saw HTTP traffic. Um, oh, it helps if you spell it right, Chris. <laughs> There we go. Hey, look at that. So we got another hit. So what's this telling us? So this is telling us that it saw a user agent string 117 times. Oh, wait, that matches this, right? So what we're looking at is the user agent string that this system is using when it's connecting to that system there. Okay, what's this user agent string? It is this internal um, private address saying that it's running Mozilla 4, MSIE 7.0, and it's running on a Windows NT 5.1 SV1 system. In Discord, quick, quick, let's see who can come up with this first. 
What operating system is that? And does that make sense for our environment? One of the cool things about checking user agents is you can kind of sanity check, right? Someone says Windows 7, I see a bunch of Windows XPs. Oh, people are jumping in on this quick, that's awesome. So yeah, my first thought was Windows 7 because of MSIE 7, but it's actually not. You wanna look at this string here. So it's Windows NT 5.1, that's Windows XP. SV1 means Service Pack 1. So this is Windows XP running Service Pack 1. Well, that is how this private address on my network is identifying itself. It's pretty easy for me to figure out if I'm still running a Windows XP system or not, right? In other words, if I go over there and that's a Windows 10 system, oh, I know I got a problem. <laughs> Why is my Windows 10 system identifying itself as Windows XP? And usually it's because this isn't the actual real user agent string. This is a user agent string that's used for this uh, particular command and control channel to identify itself to the command and control server when it calls in. So yeah, as far as what's in this PCAP file, I want to run this system down. There's clearly something bad happening here. And there's more stuff we can do to run this down. I'm actually going to cover that on a later webcast. Um, I'll go through and kind of talk about that then. Um, I think uh, I saw it get advertised in the Discord channel a couple of times, but I, I want to go through the, uh, the Threat Hunters runbook, right? So if, you know, what is the Threat Hunters runbook? What is that process you should use to go through and do a network-based hunt? I'm going to go through and kind of cover that um, in a webcast in the beginning of April. So if you're interested, you may want to go in and kind of check that out. So let's talk about, so we just went in and we just ran Reader and hey, bang, off the bat, we found something. But what if we want to do some tweaking to Reader? Is there any way to kind of tweak some of the settings? And in fact, there is. So I can go in and I can say under Etsy Reader, I can go in, there's two files. There's the license, which it's an open source license. And then there's the config.yaml file. This is what actually configures Reader to kind of identify how it's going to run. So let's go through and talk about this one a little bit. So first thing is we identify where is the Mongo database. Notice that we've installed Mongo locally as part of installing Rita. So it's at the loopback address. Notice we've also <laughs> got rid of any authentication when talking to it. And yeah, so the uh, authentication mechanism is null and we've disabled TLS. Whoa, way back, you're shutting off encryption and you're shutting off authentication? Yes. And we're doing that because Mongo is running on the local host. If, so the only way to get to this Mongo database is to already be on this system and have root level access. If I'm already on this box and have root level access, I don't need to connect through a socket to get to that Mongo database. The files are just available to me in the raw. So this doesn't open up any type of security hole. However, what if you run a Mongo cluster and you wanna save all of this information within your Mongo cluster? Well, that's gonna be across the network. If you do this across the network, please, 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 Enable authentication, please, please, please enable TLS, you know, and data privacy. So we turn this off to save overhead because it's on the local system by default when we install it. If you change that and put the database someplace else, please make sure you go through and secure that setup. So that's at the beginning of the file. This section here, rolling, what's this about? So remember I said, Rita, uh, works in large chunks of data. By default, read is going to work with 24 hour chunks of data. I said you could do a week instead if you wanted to. It'll take longer to run, but it can look at this stuff in you know one week chunks instead. Well, how do I change that? Well, I just change the number of hours I want in the chunk. So if I want to go through and do a week, it'd be, what is that, 168 hours or something like that? And I'd go through and change that to whatever the value is I want to use for that. So I can kind of play with how much data I'm working with. And like I said, for most of us, 24 hours is plenty. Because for a command and control channel, there's a balancing act. They want to make it slow enough or go off less. They, they want to have the dwell time be long enough that you're not going to easily catch it. 
right? Because if it's calling out four times a second, all you got to do is launch a packet capture tool, right? You know, run Wireshark and you'll see those two IP addresses scroll by all the time. That makes it pretty easy to figure out there's a connection taking place there. So the attackers don't want to do that. So they want to trigger less often so it's not as obvious this is taking place. The problem is the longer that trigger interval, the longer they got to wait to interact with it. So imagine, so you could go in and you could say, hey, only have this thing call home once a month, right? And now it's only beaconing out once a month and that's gonna be really hard to tag because I need a year's worth of data or something like that to catch it. Well, why don't bad guys do that all the time? Well, here's the problem. Let's say I go in and say, you know, LS list out all the files on this directory. Well, I might have to wait 30 days <laughs> for that command to execute and get an answer back because I'm on a 30 day dwell cycle. Even worse, what if um, nation state, my boss comes to me and says, hey, we need to take advantage of that back door you have to exfiltrate information about an attack or do this other thing to try and save lives or try and shut this other thing down that, you know, cripples their ability to go after, you know, yet another country or, you know, whatever. And you got to say to them, oh, well, hey, the compromised system won't call home for two weeks. So you got to wait two weeks for me to be able to do that. You know, that's not going to fly either, right? So the dwell time can't be so long that the channel becomes useless, but it can't be so fast that it's easily spotable. So that's why these 10 things tend to go off about every 15 minutes or less. So if you're worried about 15 minutes or less, every 15 minutes, that's going to be 100 signals in, an, in a 24 hour period of time. You'll spot that. If it's, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. If it's um, you're worried about something even more advanced than that for some reason, because you've got super secret data you need to protect. Yep, you can go in and change that number. And this number is just simply I, it default chunks is kind of I'm not sure why we wrote it that way, because really what we're saying is this is the number of hours that you want to go through and process at the same time. And that now this is for live only. If I have a PCAP that is let's say three days long, and I pull that into Zeek and process it in Rita, it's gonna process that as that entire PCAP in one, one fell swoop. It won't look at this number and change the way it processes it. This only is applicable to when we're, um, when Zeek is listening on the wire, it's watching data go by, and we're pulling it in as it, it writes its log entries out. How long do we wanna write, how much log entries do we wanna have before we go through and process them? This says 24 hours worth. You can then go in and identify the log level. This is where law, uh, Rita say it so it stores its logs. We'll go back and take a look at that later. Normally, you're not going to have to tweak anything here. Um, you know, user config, what's this? Rita, uh, every, by default, every uh, 14 days, every two weeks, Rita is just going to do a version check to see if you're running the latest version or not. And if you're not, it will pop up and tell you, hey, you're not running the latest version. In which case you can go up, grab the latest install script, run it again, or actually usually you can run the same install script you have and it'll figure out that it needs to get a newer version. Um, it'll go off and do that. But um, yeah, you know, this just lets you know, hey, there's a newer version of reader out there that you can play, pay attention to. Um, filters. So what's this section about? So this section uh, identifies a couple of things. It identifies my never includes and my always includes. What's this about? My never includes are traffic that are not going to be indicative of an internal system that's been compromised calling out to a command and control server out on the internet. So for example, traffic that goes to the local multicast address. Well, it's not going out to the internet to some specific system. So that's probably, that's not going to carry command and control. So we're going to ignore that. Um, anytime you've got a host that is trying to figure out its boot IP address, it may come out as zero, 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 zero. Okay. Ignore that. That's just a system trying to come online. You're not going to find any command and control in that. Um, anything that goes out is like broadcast traffic, right? That's just broadcasting on the local network. It's not talking to a host out on the internet. So my never includes filter out some of that traffic that isn't going to contain any command and control. So we're not wasting CPU cycles actually looking for command and control within it. And you can tweak this section any way you want to. If you look at this and you say, oh no, I am actually worried about broadcasts 
you know, carrying command and control traffic, great. You can go in, you can comment this out, restart Rita, bang, it's gonna have that for you. Uh, but these are the ones that we pull out by default. My always includes, where might I wanna add something in there? Let's say I've got a proxy server that people talk to. I may wanna put my proxy server on this list because if I have a compromised system that's then talking to another internal host, or actually if any of my internal systems talking to another internal system, we're gonna ignore that because it's internal to internal communications. We're looking for internal talking to a command and control server out on the internet. So normally internal to internal will get ignored. Well, a proxy server connects out to the internet for people, right? So I have two ways I could kind of monitor for C2 with a proxy. I could monitor the traffic after the proxy, in which case now if I say, yeah, hey, that looks like command and control, all it's gonna show me is it, was, it came from the proxy server. Now I gotta go through the proxy server logs to figure out what the real host was that actually generated that traffic. My other option is to monitor in front of the proxy between the, my endpoints and my proxy server. And now I'll actually see which system it was doing that, but only if I add the proxy server's IP address here because it's an internal IP. So any uh, another possibility might be internal resolvers. You may wanna add those to this list. That way, if this C2 over DNS, you'll get good visibility off of that. So my proxy servers, my DNS servers, those are ones I might wanna include here and my always include. Um, my never include list, usually you shouldn't have to muck with that too much. You also wanna identify what is my internal address space. Notice we've just carved out all the privates by default. We just said, okay, you're probably using one of these or multiple. So we'll go through and assume all of these are private. Now, let's say you're using um, one out uh, 10 dot something internally, but you've got business partners that are using 192.168 dot something, and you don't want to ignore any potential beacons going out to their network. That's fine. Just go in and comment this out, you know? So you can comment this down to only your address space if you want to. You can then go through, are there any domains you want? So same thing, but with fully qualified domain names instead of IP addresses. We have always include and never includes on those lists. So for example, I may want to never include uh, Microsoft.com, Windows.com, right? Because that's probably my Windows systems checking for packet, pat, patches or talking to the Windows notification service or you know something along those lines there. So I may want to go through and add those in. Um, I've also got my blacklist here. So notice I can go in and I can identify what blacklist do I want to feed in. So I can go through and include that here. Um, if I have raw files of uh, lists of IPs I want to pull in, I can go in and I can do that as well. I, like I said, I'm not a big blacklist person, but if you're still trying to use them, if you're still trying to use Thread Intel, you can pull in directly off of a feed or you can pull things in off of a text file that includes that information. You know, this will work either way. Now for beacons. So we talked about identifying a beacon. We talked about how you kind of hit a maximum where it's just obvious there's persistency there, right? When we wanted to kick something over into being uh, identify it as a strobe instead. Well, what about the low end? How many connections do you see, need to see in a 24 hour period of time before you're gonna say, let's analyze this for a beacon. In other words, uh, let's say my internal IP address calls an IP address out in the internet once in the course of 24 hours. Should I do a math analysis on that to figure out if there's a beacon? Well, there's only one connection. There's <laughs> nothing really to analyze, right? What about two connections? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, no, probably not, right? Still, it's only two connections. Where, where's that magic number? We've gone with 20 and have found that to be a good threshold to work with. Because if you think about it, if a system's compromised and it's calling home once per hour, which is pretty slow, that's still gonna be once per hour, 24 times a day or so. So by checking for 20 or more, you're gonna be able to catch that. Should you change this number down to 10? You can if you want to. Uh, we haven't found a whole lot of benefit to that. But if you're just really worried that, you know, someone's on your network only beaconing like four times a day, you could go in and add, you know, change that number to four. Just keep in mind that the lower you make this number, the longer it's going to take Rita to process all of your data. 
Beacon's based on fully qualified domain name. Instead of IP address, same type of thing. You can set a minimum threshold. You can do the same thing for Beacon uh, for proxy traffic. So we'll actually check proxy traffic to see, hey, is there anything in there that looks like potential uh, beacon traffic? So if you're using a proxy, you may or may not want to tweak this. Usually you want to just you know leave it off. Should you check for C2 over DNS? The default is true. Do you want to look at user agent strings? The default is true. So if you don't care about user agent strings, go ahead and shut that off. If you've got some other solution that you think does a really good job of catching C2 over DNS, you can go through and you can shut that off. But we turn, the all, turn on all the features by default. This number identifies where is that threshold where something stops looking like a beacon and we just log it as a strobe and call it done. And it's 86,400 times. 86,400, so I said three times a second, we used to actually have this set up a little bit higher. Uh, we lowered it just to kind of improve performance a bit. 86,400 is once per second. So if you have a system calling out to an IP address on the internet once per second or more, we're gonna just log that as a strobe and call it done. You know, it, Cause again, if it's connecting out once per second, yeah, there's persistency there. You don't need math there to help you out. If there's uh, 30 connections in a day, you need math to figure out is that connection persistency or not, right? Is it 30 connections all at the same time? Is it 30 connections spread out somewhat evenly throughout the course of the day? But in that first case, 30 all at once, no, that's not a beacon. 30 times spread out in the course of the day, yeah, that is a beacon. So I might need math to help me figure out if that's persistency or not. But once per second or more, you yeah, know, I don't need math, <laughs> right? All I need is Wireshark to tell me this persistency connection there. So this is just when we start stop calling something a beacon and start calling it a strobe instead. So that's my config file. So like I said, I could go through, make any of those changes if I wanted to. Uh, let's see, what else haven't I showed you yet? Oh, I know. Uh, so I can do a Rita test config, and this will actually uh, show me what are all those config settings as well, what's actually getting loaded. So this is telling me, you know, how often do you go out and check for updates? Basically all this stuff we just talked about, right? What, is, what was in the config file? What was the config file set to? This will go through and this will give you a summary of all that information. So this is the, the first way I showed you was actually the config file that I can edit and make changes in this if I want to. But if I just want to view how all of this stuff is set, I can go through and I can do a simple read a test config for that. Um, let's see, final thing I wanted to show you is, let's take a look at the logs. So if I say var lib Rita, okay, so var, var Rita, uh, that var lib Rita log, gee, say that 10 times fast, uh, is where all of my log files are gonna get located. It's gonna go through and each log file will be for a specific day. I only have this one log file because I just set this up today. So if I hit enter on that, here's what's gotten recorded. So notice it goes through and, and it's telling me, um, hey, at this timestamp, someone ran the import command using these arguments that are off the right hand side of the screen. And you know, here were the files that I found that I need to go through and process. So remember the well, once I got reader installed, the first thing I did is I said reader space import space test. Go in and import all those Zeek logs and then call that database test. These were the log files that actually imported. And then here's what it named that database test. And then all the commands I went and ran after that start showing up down here. So here's it going through and running all of its. So all of this, uh, actually up to here, all of this up to here was that import process. So if I'm trying to import data and it's not creating the database for some reason, this is where I would go look to try and figure out what's going on. I'd you know, go looking for something failing or something not looking right in all of this. This line here, is my version of Rita checking to see, uh, am I actually running the current version or not? So it says every 14 days, but it's gonna run it the first day that I run Rita. 
And then every 14 days after that, I'll go back and it'll check again. Here, remember the first Rita command I ran was Rita space list to see what my databases were. Here it is showing me that I ran that command. Here's all the other commands that I then went through and ran after that, all those show commands that I ran. So this gives you a good audit trail of everything you've done with Rita. So if you need to go through and run things down, you can. Now this is at info level. I can change this to only show errors if I want to try and reduce the size of this log file. But that is Rita in a nutshell. So that gives you a quick walkthrough on this. Um, wait, Chris, where do I get all those commands? Well, I included them here. So all the commands I just ran are in these slides. Um, this is a comment <laughs> that I said yes for each zero, and I said no for anything else. But you know, you can see here's all the commands I ran through. Notice even log out and then reconnect via SSH, because remember I needed to do that in order to make sure all my Zeek stuff was in my path. And then here's where I went through and pulled down that PCAP and then got it imported into Rita. Here's where we kind of listed out the Rita uh, database. And then here are all the show commands that I ran. So you've got everything in this slide deck. And again, this slide deck is under ACM-webcast-content. So you can go through and you can grab it there. Uh, folks were also asking about recordings on this. Yeah, we definitely recorded this. This definitely will be available for prosperity. So you can go back and watch this later. So if you decide later, hey, I can't set up Rita right now, Chris, but I definitely want to get this set up. But it's got to take me a couple of days to, you know, plug the hardware in or something. Great. In a couple of days, go watch through this video. It'll step you through the whole process. Uh, here's all that config stuff we talked about. And that's it in a nutshell. So like I said, we got a couple of cool things coming up after this. Uh, we've got a packet deco class. I have a lot of fun with that class. Uh, we basically kind of this that isn't a threat hunting class. That is a here's how to understand network communications. How do you read packet decodes? What do all of these fields mean? And I, I do it not in a generic sense. I definitely do it with a very security oriented look. So, you know, so for example, I probably talk a lot more about the IP ID than anybody else who teaches packet decoding. And I do that because you can do passive fingerprinting with, with the IP ID. You can do uh, blind port scanning with the IP ID. So, you know, yeah, there's other classes that kind of go through all the fields, but I do it from our perspective as security people. What is it we need to worry about? Uh, that level one threat hunting class, we've had well over 20,000 people go through that now. Um, that's a very cool class. Well, so we'll be running that one for free. And then I've got an advanced threat hunting network that's going to be going off. Be nice if this one was after that one, because this one kind of gets you ready for this here. But the advanced threat hunting, that is like two thirds of that is all hands on labs, which is kind of fun. And if you kind of want to, so let's say you go through, you get Rita up and running, and you kind of want to spend a little bit um, more time on that and want to go a little bit deeper on how do I do hunting, we're actually going to do a webcast on that. So on April 6th, on April 6th apply the Threat Hunters Runbook. I'm going to talk about, hey, here's the process for doing network-based threat hunting. Now let's apply this with Rita. How would we go through and use Rita to go through and, and implement this process? And some of it will be using, so I'll start off using Rita, but in a lot of ways, Rita is just going to show me where this connection persistency. Once it identifies connection pairs I need to worry about, we'll actually be jumping into raw Zeek data after that. So it'll be a combination of those two. But I gave you a link here to go sign up. Uh, someone was asking, hey, could you run the advanced class later in the year? Uh, the plan is to do exactly that. So all three of these classes, if none of these dates work for you, um, give it a little bit. We're going to add in more as we go through the course of the year. And that's all I got. So I don't know if uh, folks want to jump back on real quick. We can kind of do a wrap up on this. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I don't really believe we have any outstanding questions. So uh, I think that speaks to the way you went through it. it no, nah, I blame Bill. <laughs> Bill takes care of all my extra questions. 
Well, that's true. Actually, I, sometimes I think he's like an answer bot. He does it yes. so quick. <laughs> we'll get like half a sentence typed and he's already sent a paragraph. Yeah. Bill is not actually a real human. He's artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go for artificial ignorance, but I'm flexible. I'm really flexible on that. Yeah, really. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, C. Breton, maybe how to collect your PCAP with Zeke. Yep, we'll definitely talk about that next time um still love the mass accent <laughs> yeah i've been in florida for a couple of years but i definitely still have the mass new H mass new hampshire uh accent going to me so uh you can take the man out of massachusetts but you can't take massachusetts out of the man yeah, yeah something so, like that yeah well at least <laughs> he did this like from that. his office not from his car yeah oh. <laughs> Hey, thank Although you, I got to do at least one part. of these from my pool. So, oh, oh hey, no. that'd be nice. <laughs> one, one of these days, I got to do one of these from my pool. Nice. Yeah, I, I just go with battery power, not 120 volts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Exactly. Uh -huh. But, you know, this like wireless and, you know, so like, why do I have to sit in an office for this? I could be in a pool. So, sure. yeah. They even make monster Ziploc baggies. You can put your laptop in it. There you go. <laughs> Uh, let's say Steven said, found this motivating. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's exactly what we go for here. Yeah. Where's your Duncan? Yeah. Oh, well, and, and even down here in Florida, there's so many flatlanders down here in Florida now that they, well, I, actually, I guess that description doesn't work down here because Florida is flat too. But yeah, there's a lot of Dunkin Donuts opening up in this area. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cocktails of three to host and Mike Crispy in his poll. Yep, I am down for that. Totally Ooh. down for that. Cool. With that said, I think we're done. So uh, thank you, everybody, for turning out. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the thank yous to us for putting these on. But for me, it's, you know, thank you just as much for you because we are using your time. You know, you have a limited resource, which is time. That's a non-refundable quantity that you choose to spend on us to spend these webcasts with us, uh, which means an awful lot. So thank you for everybody who came out today. Uh, these things are always fun. We have a ball with them. Um, it, it, it's one of my many opportunities to pick on Bill. So it always goes well. <laughs> and if you've got questions or if you want to keep the discussion going, please feel free. Use the live webcast chat channel. Uh, this is a great place for you to come back in two hours and say, hey, where can I find so-and-so? And, -so? and uh, in, in many cases, the answers you'll get in that channel are a whole lot better than you would get from us anyways. Yes. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's, Ryan, that's you get anything great. before we call it quits? Good here. I do not. I got the links out for the recording in the recording channel. So look there. And that's all I got. I guess we're good to go. And, and I might add in one quick one, if that's okay. Yeah, on go for Thursday, it. I'm giving a talk on using SSH keys. So if you're interested, if you're using SSH passwords and you'd like to do something a little bit better, we would love to have you join us. Uh, the If you look up on, I believe Black Hills has a link to that. Uh, I'm not sure if I have one, strangely enough. I can find uh, that. Bill, Bill, you damn corporate sellout advertising other webcasts you're doing. I, I would <laughs> never do something like that. Yeah, really? Sure. Oh, Thanks, and somebody Brian. was asking about the spinny things behind me. So they, they, well, there's two possibilities. We're still not sure what. Uh, one possibility it is, is to hypnotize you into thinking that this is all easy and you can do it too, which you can. Or I've got a really bad mouse problem in the house and these are mouse chasers and it causes them all to run away. So it's one or the other. We're still not sure which. <laughs> and for the folks giving thoughts to Lisa and her family, thank you. Uh, appreciated. All and right. I think that's it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I will, I will end Thanks. this webinar. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.